Well, morning everyone. Very warm welcome to our 11 o'clock service. My name's Ben. I'm part of the team here. Welcome, particularly if you're new or you're visiting or you still feel new. Uh, it's great to have you with us. At this church, we are a church that knows that Jesus is at the center of all we do. The Bible is our guide and people matter. And as we go through our service today, we'll be reminded of all those things, that Jesus is at the center of who we are and all that we do. The Bible is our guide and people matter. Now, before we get going, I've got a few notices to give. The first is that uh, I need a woo after this notice. Uh, our annual general meetings tomorrow. So if you want to come along to our APCM, it meets in here at 745 We'll be re-electing church wardens. We'll be electing people to PCC positions, treasurer. But more than that, more importantly than that, it's an opportunity to look back over God's faithfulness to us as a church over the last year and look forward to all that's to come. So do join us if you want to tomorrow evening, 7.45 in here. Secondly, really special announcement about the Lodge Trust. So as we know... Many of our congregation at this service are from the Lodge Trust. And last week, Lisa gave me these invitation cards because the Lodge is celebrating their 40th year this year. And so um, they're throwing a party and you're invited. Um, there's cake. There's Richard, there's also a very young-looking Richard on the front of this flyer. I don't know, yeah. Um, so if you want one of these flyers to remind you there at the back. That's coming up at 11 a.m. on the 18th of May. So a little bit of time away. Take one of these as you go. You'd be really, really welcome to join with them as they celebrate. Also on Thursday, our next CAP money course begins. Uh, you heard about it a couple of weeks ago, but it's been a brand newly refreshed course. So it might be that you want to do the course just for yourself so that you're able to know what goes on at the course so that you can then invite others in the future. You'd be really welcome, not too late to sign up. And finally, I publish the bands of marriage between Daniel James Auckland of this parish and Lisa Marie Pilkington also of this parish. Uh, if anyone knows any just impediment why these two persons should not be joined together in holy matrimony, you are to declare it now. This is the second time of asking. Great. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, love and for the marriage that's going to be happening between Daniel and Lisa. Lord, pray, we pray that as they prepare for married life together, that you might draw close to them in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you're willing and able, why don't you stand with me? Um, our opening sentence today comes from the Bible reading that Martin will be preaching from later. It's 1 John 2, 6, and it says... Whoever claims to live in Jesus must live as Jesus did. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. And one of the reasons that we gather together as God's people in this place is to realign our priorities around living as disciples of Jesus Christ, that we might be known by him and make him known in this place. Heavenly Father, we welcome you by your Spirit to be with us today, that you might shape us to be more like Jesus our Lord, that we might live like him because we're in him. And Lord, we pray that today through our worship, through the words that are said from the front, through the word of God that we read, through uh, every element of this service, we might know Jesus is Lord that he loves us, he wants what's best for us. Lord, we just reorientate our whole focus on you at the start of this service and declare you are Lord in this place. Love past as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the Prince of Life, our ransom, shall.
shed for us his precious blood who is love will not remember who can cease to sing his praise he can never be forgotten throughout hands eternity On the mount of crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide. Through the flood gates of God's mercy, flow the past and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers, poured in
could you not worship a God who's conquered death, whose victory over the grave has won for us a way that we too can be welcomed into eternal life to be with him forever. Jesus is Lord and he's alive and he deserves the highest praise that we give him. But Jesus doesn't just want to be first in our praise. He wants to be first in every aspect of our life, in our schedule, in our daytime, in our prayer time, the first thing we think about in the morning, the last thing we think about at night. Jesus wants to be first in every avenue and area of our life, including our finances. So those of us who are uh, part of this church, give to the church, either through our bank accounts or through the wooden box at the back. And as we do so, each week we declare this, Lord, everything we have comes from you. Please use our gifts to build your kingdom. But as we declare our faith in, a, in the risen Lord Jesus, we know that the reason he died was because of our sinfulness. We gather as sinners in need of a saviour. We gather as fallen, broken people in need of healing and wholeness. So let's take a moment as we sit down just to reflect and ask the Holy Spirit to uh, bring to the surface in us those things which we've done or said or thought we we shouldn't have done and confess our sins to him. Last week our reading in 1 John 1 said, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So let's confess our sins using the words on the screen. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his Spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. We say together the prayer that Jesus taught his followers. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And Father, we bless your name for drawing to this place all of these wonderful children and young people that we get to work with week by week as they go off to their activities now. Be with them and their leaders just as you remain here also. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, follow the bright high vis Joe and Dave over to Cheney Lane. And we will see you later. And whilst they're going out, why not just briefly turn to the person next to you, check in with them, say, hi, how are you doing? And uh, greet them. Wonderful. Let's uh, draw our attention back to the front and Deborah's going to come and lead us in our prayers today. Thanks, Deborah. Let's pray. Good morning, everyone. Let us pray. Father God, you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords and the Prince of peace. 
In your goodness, in your love, in your mercy, we worship you. We ask for your miraculous peace across the Middle East and that the crises in Gaza and in Ukraine and Sudan and others resolve. We ask for your peace across India, especially during the election season and for your will to be done. May all who are suffering for their beliefs find justice and may your presence lift their burdens and refresh their spirits by your pure and living water. Internationally and in our own nation, we ask for wise and humble leadership that honours you. Here at St George's, we thank you for all who have found new faith in Christ. We pray and thank you for your Holy Spirit's presence in the Alpha Discipleship course underway and in all our services. We pray for your presence at the Equip course, the staff team time away, the young adults weekend away, and at Prayer Central and the contemplative prayer space. May the annual meeting of the PCC tomorrow give you the glory for all that has been achieved this year with more to come. We look forward to the arrival of our new curate soon and pray for the recruitment of a youth worker, lifting Matt, Joe and the Raising Generations team as they lead and inspire the young people. We ask for energy for Louise and the Fresh Hope team and new opportunities for people in need in our community. For Shep, especially that more beds will be donated for families in need. For Simon and the CAP team, supporting people overwhelmed by debt. And that more people come to know you through Friday Connect and the Connect Plus service. Thank you for all who serve in the church. And for Hope House, safe families and befrienders working amongst those of us who are struggling. We are happy to see fresh buds of growth in the villages and market towns surrounding Stamford and ask your will to be done for the vacancies in Ketton and in Rye Hall, Essendine and Colby. We are excited to see flourishing in Spalding and Grantham, asking for your ongoing blessing as they build relationships with the community, especially in schools, and that newcomers and new staff settle in well. May giftings be released to fill key gaps. We remember our mission partners, the Wilsons and the Bretts. In this country, we ask for inspired conversations with Muslim neighbours, the Bible in the Mirpuri language, your calling and blessing for native speaker pastors, and healing for Andy's headaches. Thank you that Naomi is enjoying her work and Luke is enjoying school and new friends. We ask for health and protection for Pete and Carol in Turkey and breakthrough for new groups to start, including the new group in the earthquake zone, that you may be glorified. We remember now all who are bereaved, especially Jerry and Claire and all who mourn the death of June Green. May the celebration of Jean's life this week be a time of joy and glory to God. We pause to ask for your gentle healing touch for all we know who are weary, struggling with health or other challenges. Finally, Please bless Martin as he brings your word today. May our eyes, ears and hearts be open to receive and to respond. Father God, we give you all the glory, honour and praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Man, thank you, Deborah, so much. Um, 
we would covet your prayers actually on Wednesday, our new curates meeting with the bishop. And at that point, everything we hope and pray is finalised, at which point we can say a little bit more about them. So do be praying for that meeting on Wednesday. Now we get to the point in the service where it's over to you. So we love to hear stories of God answering prayers and moving powerfully in people's lives. So every now and again in our services, we make a bit of space in the service to allow people to come and share testimonies of things that God's doing. So if there's anything that's going on in your life that you want to thank God for or that you think would just build us up as a congregation as we hear what the Lord's doing in your life, then now's an opportunity to share. I'm going to sit down and then if two or three people want to share, that'd be great. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Shep, um, every so often, things kind of dovetail in a way only God can arrange. Needs arise and donations are made that kind of match perfectly. Um, Two Thursdays ago, we um, put together some very basic um, furniture for for a man from Grantham. Um, who arrived, who the council had put in Stamford. Um, and he had, he had a bed, I think, and a chair. Um, so we, we gave him kind of emergency basics. And then this week, the team went again with a longer list of items for him. Um, he um, has mobility issues. Um, but on Thursday morning, we don't often get carpets delivered. Um, offered to Shep but Thursday morning we had two carpets to pick up um, and this man's flat has no carpets it's just concrete floors so um, so the team that was on picked up the carpets don't know whether they connected the two needs I don't know but when they went to his flat um, they (laughs) <laughs> put me right if I'm wrong they spent an extra I don't know how long fitting these new carpets he had, so he had a lounge fitted had his bedroom fitted he had a, a runner for his corridor and we just it's just so wonderful to be able to meet needs like that and just I'm just sort of praising God for the way it's all worked together so A year last August, our oldest grandson was on, came away from Folkestone and had been on deployment. Came back to Peterborough looking very, very poorly. He went to the hospital, diagnosed leukaemia, age 23. He spent the first six months in Peterborough. Peterborough in isolation partly chemo one of the sessions he contracted um, sepsis he was in a really really bad way many people prayed for him churches around the area and church people in St George's he came out he came through that and was transferred to Adam Brooks or during this time, we asked him, would you like us to pray for him? And he said, yes, please. He's never been a Christian, and I can't judge whether he is at the moment now. We bought him a, a young person's Bible. When we opened the first page, at the, at the bottom in t- tiny text was Joshua in one nine. Have I not told you, be brave, be courageous, for the Lord your God is with you. His name is Josh. He was transferred to Adam Brooks, where he went and went bone marrow transplant. His donor was his half-sister, who lives in Scotland, and she had 
she had joined the Anthony Nolan Trust ten years prior to him being going down with leukemia. Don't believe in consequences. Believe in miracles. He's now been, been medically discharged from the army and he's got a job in Peebra Hospital working on the ward where he spent six months and he's in remission. Thank you. Let me share one story that I heard this week that really raised my faith. I was uh, meeting with a guy who runs Fusion, which is the student network. So when people go off to university, they plug them into local Christian unions and churches. And he said at Freshers Week, a man came up to him, a young man came up to him and said, I need to join a local church. And he said, well, which church are you already part of at home? He said, I've never been to a church before. So they got chatting about that and uh, it turns out that he had been on a sort of lads weekend away to Malta, a very Roman Catholic part of the world and they found some crosses, like big bishops crosses in Malta and the boys thought, non-Christians, they thought wouldn't it be funny if we bought these crosses and wore them all the time at the swimming pool, in the pub, in the club, at the hotel. You can understand for a non-Christian bunch of lads why that might be seen as fun. So they buy these bishops' crosses and put them round their neck, and they're just convicted of sin, and they just ca- they can't do anything. They don't go to a single nightclub. They spend the whole week, the lads' weekend away with a group of nuns, <laughs> who who explain to them who Jesus is and why the cross has power. And uh, they get back on the plane from Malta and land and go off to university. And his first thing at the Freshers' Fair is, who is this Jesus and why is there such power in the cross? Isn't that wonderful? (laughs) Let's worship the Lord Jesus. Let's stand together.
take your seats and as you do so grab your bible you'll notice we now store the bibles at the back so hopefully they were given out as you came in if you haven't got one and you want one, i'm sure if you wave uh, at the back they will just come and deliver you one you need to turn there's one here please dave if you'd be so kind turn to page one two two five and one at the back row here let's just wait great couple here couple here fantastic and roger's going to introduce our reading properly for us The reading is taken from 1 John chapter 2, beginning at verse 3. Love and hatred for fellow believers. We know that when we have come to know him, we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, 
is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. But this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must leave, live as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have heard since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. Reasons for writing. I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. On not loving the world. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, good to be with you again. Uh, my name's Martin, and I'm on the staff team here. And do keep that passage open in front of you, 1 John chapter 2 on page 1225. We're, we've just started a series called Walking in the Light, um, and it's going to run for a little while, seven or eight weeks, as we go through 1 John. Now, uh, every Tuesday evening, we've been running a post-alpha group with about 20 people looking at Mark's gospel together. And last Tuesday, two members of the group who've been baptized in the last year uh, both shared their testimonies with the wider group. One was planned, and the other was kind of riffing off the one who uh, shared. And Trina, um, who shared her testimony at the Easter baptisms, if you remember there, if you were here, Trina shared her testimony. And she, um, in front of 20 people, she was much more fluent and, and you know, no, it was much less nerve-wracking for her. She just told the story really naturally. And uh, basically, she'd started coming around St. George's, but she had a drug addiction. And she was trying to hide from Debs because Debs would keep on finding her when she was doing things that she uh, thought that she shouldn't be doing. And, but she couldn't break free from her drug addiction. And uh, so she ends up getting, she said, miraculously given a place at a rehab center where they taught the 12 steps. And of course, the 12-step program insists that you must believe in a higher power, a higher power that you can't help yourself, you need a higher power to help you. So for Trina, who'd been around church, she kind of, well, Jesus is going to be my higher power. So she starts to talk to Jesus about her problem. And with the help of this 12-step program, with talking to Jesus, her, her drug addiction has just gone. And everybody who knows her can see that she's completely changed, especially her children. Katrina is a changed person. Of course, she gives all the, the credit to Jesus. Now, Chris is also in my post-alpha group. Chris Immam was also baptized, and he was also a cocaine addict. And he then shared his testimony. Eleven months ago, having been a cocaine addict, uh, kind of the morning after the night before where he'd taken some drugs, he woke up in the morning, and the Lord clearly said to him, Chris, 
Why are you doing this to yourself? And he's not touched cocaine since. The habit was broken in that little conversation with the Lord. Completely free. He's just come back from the place where all of that grew, that addiction, Doncaster, where he used to live. And he came to Stanford to get away from Doncaster, but he went back to see family and friends. And he came back last Sunday and he saw Ben. And the first thing he said to Ben is, Ben, Doncaster needs Jesus. Now, if we were to ask Chris or Trina how they knew they were Christians, they could both say, well, look at the difference he's made to my life. He's changed my life. And one of the reasons John is writing this letter is that he wants people to be certain of the faith, knowing that they know. How do you know that you know Jesus? And uh, look at uh, uh, the first verse of our reading, chapter 2, verse 3. We know that we have come to know if we keep his command. So we can know that we know. How do we know that we know? And we're going to look at three signs that we know that we can know, that show us that we belong to Jesus. And it's like a three-legged stool. Um, we live like him, we love like him, and we don't love the world. And I'll explain each of those in turn. So we know that we can know Jesus because, first of all, we live like Jesus. Look at verses 3 to 6. We know we've come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but doesn't do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus lived. So live like Jesus. The first leg on the stool of knowing that we belong to Jesus is that we keep his commands, verse 3. We know we've come to know him if we keep his commands. Now, when Jesus gave the apostles the Great Commission in Matthew 28, he go and said, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. Obeying God's word shows our love for God and that he's at work in us and that we are in him. Verse 5, if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. So Christian experience of the Holy Spirit is not an end in itself. I've had an experience of the Holy Spirit, therefore I'm a Christian. You can't just, you, you can't see the evidence of the work. Somebody can claim that, but what's the evidence of it? Well, a true experience of the Holy Spirit leads to an inward desire to be like Jesus. The Spirit of Jesus comes to live in you to make you more like Jesus by walking in obedience to his commands. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. It's not just about, it's not legalism. It's about the work of the Spirit in you, producing the life and character of Jesus. And the Word of God guides us as to what that looks like. Now, in my garden, um, I've got quite a few fruit trees. And it's that time of year where they're all flowering. They're springing into life. The apple tree has got its apple blossom on. The walnut tree has got big fonds that look like they're going to turn into walnuts if the pesky squirrel doesn't get them. He took them last year. I sat at 7 o'clock every morning. He was there. I think he must have come across from Burley Park. And he climbs up the tree. I wish I had an air rifle. And he, and he, and, and he bit and he ate. They don't wait for the nuts to grow. They eat them when they're forming into early form nuts. They take them away. And then I've got a mulberry tree at the bottom of the garden. And of course, you know that expression, caught red-handed. It's from nicking mulberries. The kids, when they nick mulberries, their hands were stained blood red because mulberries are the most juicy, juicy, potent red juice you have ever seen. And you can't get it off. You can tell somebody who's been nicking mulberries. It's everywhere. And if you've got clothes that are light colored, um, you cannot get the stain out of it. So when I go to pick my mulberries, it's black jeans and a black t-shirt and I'm fine. I do have to have a shower afterwards because like, it looks like I've been in a fight because it looks like you've got blood all over you. They're so juicy. I'll give you one next year if you ask me. Okay, but um, every tree bears its own fruit. And if we turn back to Matthew chapter 7, this is the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus uh, teaching about how you could, it's a bit like what John is describing here in 1 John. How can you tell if somebody really belongs to him? Well, it, it's the fruit that produces 
from their lives. Look at um, Matthew 7, verses 15 to 20. And some of this is in 1 John, because what John is writing to the church for is so that they're able to test some of the teaching that's going around, whether it's true or whether it's false, and whether they should listen to it or not listen to it. Okay, One John, uh, sorry, Matthew 7, 15 to 20. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. And John picks this up in verse 4, I think. Whoever says, I know him, but doesn't do what he commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. So if we say we don't know him, sorry, so we say we do know him, but we don't follow his commands, we're a liar. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Followers of Jesus are recognized by living like Jesus. So one of the ways we can know that we're in Christ and that he is in us is that we keep his commands. And his commands aren't pick and mix. You know, Jesus calls us to obey all of his commands. And becoming like Jesus is a process. As the Holy Spirit works in us, as we get to know God's word, the Holy Spirit... um, in one sense, he brings things to the surface. We're reading the Bible. Ah, okay, that's what I need to repent of. I need to get rid of this in my life. I need to become more like Jesus here. And it's a process. Sanctification, being made holy. Uh, we're fully forgiven. All of us are fully forgiven the moment we put our faith in Jesus Christ because of his blood on the cross. But becoming more like Jesus takes a lifetime of following him, listening to the Holy Spirit, reading the word of God, and letting that change our lives. I said it's a process. On Tuesday night, when I said it's a process, Chris Inman, who was in the group, said, no, it happened to me instantly. <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes there is a, a stronghold that needs to be bust or broken, and God does a miracle to break that stronghold in our life, which then leaves us free to continue that process of sanctification. So that doesn't mean that Chris is totally sorted out because he's <laughs> broken free from cocaine. Okay, but all of us are like that. Sometimes a stronghold needs to be broken and then it's our lives conform to the life of Jesus. So the first leg on the stool of assurance is that we live like Jesus. We walk in the light in terms of this series. Our talk, I belong to Jesus, and our walk, I want to obey Jesus, go together. We love God and we love his word. Now, the second um, leg on the stool we can know that we know is that we love like Jesus. And that's all in verses 7 to 11. You know that bit about an old command and a new command, and you can't, whether he's talking about a new command or an old command, you think, what's he talking about? And then that bit about um, if you say you love God, you need to love your brother or sister. You can't hate your brother and sister and say you love God. That's an oxymoron. So, um, We'll again look at all of that. Love like Jesus. We live like Jesus. How can I know that I belong to Jesus? I love like Jesus as well. In John 13, verses 3 and 4, where Jesus is washing the disciples' feet, he says to his disciples, a new command I give you, love one another. That's the new command, love one another. But in one sense, it's not a new command, because when Jesus is asked, what's the greatest command? In the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, he says, well, it's love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. It's an old command and it's a new command. It's an old command because it's been there from the beginning in the Old Testament. It's a, a, an old command because it's right from the beginning of Jesus' teaching with his disciples. I give you a new command, but it's an old command because it's the one you received when you first started to follow him, if you get me. And it's a new command because Jesus fleshes it out for us. He shows us what love is really like in his dying for us on the cross and is serving in the washing of the feet of his disciples. It's a new command and it's an old command. Verses 7 and 8. Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one which you've had since the beginning. This command is the message you have heard. 
I love that bit where he says, the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Now, why did the early church grow so rapidly? John was writing towards the end of the first century. Why did the early church grow so rapidly in the second century? You know, in the, in the, uh, when I said this in the first service, somebody shouted out from the back because they were persecuted. Well, they were persecuted. Um, but do you know what? The, uh, in the early church, there were no big treatises on evangelism or mission, and yet the early church continued to mushroom and grow. It's because they lived out the life of Jesus. They embodied the life of Jesus. They embodied the life of love. And so when they were persecuted, they didn't hate their enemies. They prayed for those who persecuted, and they didn't retaliate and take revenge. They loved their communities. And this is what Tertullian said. He was a North African church leader in the second century. He describes it like this. You may have heard this quote before. Outsiders looked at the Christians, and they saw them energetically feeding poor people and burying them. You had no right to be buried if you didn't have any money and belonged to a club in Roman society. But Christians buried the poor dead. They gave them dignity. They cared for boys and girls who lacked property and parents. They were attentive to aged slaves and prisoners. And outsiders interpreted these actions as a work of love. And this is the famous quote. And they said, Vide, look how they love one another. Look how they love one another. Verse 10 Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there's nothing in them to make them stumble. Do you know what? I think Stanford looks at Christians Against Poverty. It looks at fresh hope and it sees signs of that love in the community at St. George's. In the love that's shared between people in the church and the love that's shared between St. George's and the wider community. And people who aren't members of the church stop me in the street and they say, we noticed what you're doing. We think it's great. We support what you're doing. You know, we want to be a community of love. We want to be a place where they say, Vide, look how they love one another. Again, one of the early church documents, the Didache, which is a second century teaching document about how to make disciples in the early church. And all this bit about hating, you can't hate a brother. If you, love, if you say you love God, you can't hate a brother or a sister. Well, the early church took this really, really seriously. In the Didache, um, they emphasized reconciling people who were at strife, who were in disagreement, who hated each other. And the Didache forbade people who were alienated from fellow believers to take part in the community's meals. Real meals, proper meals, Uh, with nourishing food, but that were Eucharistic, that were Holy Communion. And they couldn't take part in the meal until they were reconciled. And again, that's putting the teaching of Jesus into practice. If you bring your offering to the altar and you know that you've got something against your brother, first be reconciled to them and then come bring your gift. And so they're living this out in community. Look at verse 9. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Verse 11. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They don't know what they're doing because the darkness has blinded them. If we love our brothers and sisters, we show we're walking in the light. If we hate them, we're walking in darkness. We've been blinded by the darkness. And if we habitually hate and are not trying to deal with it, we can't say that we know God. If we know God, love overcomes hatred. And it's evidence that we know the Father and the Son. When I said this on something like this on Tuesday night to the Post Alpha group, they asked a question about this passage where it's talking about forgiving brothers and sisters in the church. They said, yeah, that's about the church. What happens if you hate your real brother? Like my physical brother, my sibling. I said, well, do you really hate them? I said, Well, no, but the family's fallen out. And I said, well, your heart's in the right place. You can't do anything about your sibling who won't have anything to do with you. You want to be reconciled. They don't want to be reconciled with you. Sometimes we have to let those situations lie. Ben and I do funerals all kinds of times where you come across difficult situations in families where people aren't speaking to God and they haven't done it for generations or they haven't done it for 30 years or whatever. I'm not sure whether they're coming because they've fallen out with the family. Now, 
as long as my heart isn't full of hate towards that sibling, towards that parent who's not having anything to do with me, that's fine because my heart is to want reconciliation. I've tried to make the first move, nothing's happened. You can't do anything about somebody else's responses, but we can watch our own hearts. We live like Jesus, we love like Jesus. And I recognize, as I'm saying that, sometimes people have done things to you and it's really hard. It's really hard to forgive them because you've been so badly hurt. That's, that's really, really difficult. This is talking about ordinary relationships in the church on a day-to-day -day basis, let's always seek to be reconciled one to the other. To seek to say sorry, let's make up, let's talk. And sometimes those more difficult things where there are deep wounds need people of skill to help us work them out. Now, verses 12 to 14 are written out, set out like a poem in our text. I'm not going to go through them because many of the things in there are already stuff we've looked at in chapter 1. And uh, John is addressing the whole church as children. I'm writing to you, dear children. Jesus said we must become like little children. Chapter 3, verse 1, see what great love the Father has lavished on us. That's the church that we should be called children of God. And he addresses the mature Christians as fathers, the less mature Christians as as sons, they're full of energy. And the same, some of the principles in there are things that are true of all Christians, male and female. We know God as the father and son. We know our sins are forgiven. We know that God's word indwells us. And because of Jesus, we've overcome the evil one. Those are some of the basic principles of what it means to be a Christian. So we know that we know because we live like Jesus and because we love like Jesus. My third thing, we know that we can know Jesus, we know that we know Jesus because we don't love the world. Verses 15 to 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So don't love the world. The third leg of the stool of knowing Jesus, is recognizing that our desire is to know and to love God rather than to find fulfillment in the things of this age, the things of this world. And when John uses the word world here, don't love the world, he's not using it in a John 3.16 way, God so loved the world that he gave, and God's love is for the world, the world that he made. He's using it in a different sense. He's using it in the world as organized humanity in rebellion against God. Um, the world as the object of our desires, as an idol rather than the living God who made all things. Replacing God with the things of this world. That's Don't love the world and the things of this world. Don't let your desires want those things that are made rather than being focused on who God is and loving him. Jesus said in Mark 8, 36, what good is it for us, for someone to gain the whole world, to love the whole world, to love it so much they want it avariciously for themselves, yet to lose their souls. So when we come to know Jesus, what he does is he changes our desires and the Holy Spirit breaks the power of worldly loves and reorientates us towards God. Now we all have a war of loves going on in our heart. Pulling at the love for God, love for the world. Love for God. And this is, I'm being dragged, enticed by the flesh, you know, my body has desires and it wants them to be satisfied. The eyes, I look at things and I want them because they're going to satisfy me now. My, the pride of life, getting to that place where you have position, where you're self-sufficient, where you don't see your need of God anymore. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, took these verses very seriously. And he was always aware that if you become a Christian, discipleship 
makes us more diligent and it makes us more frugal, more diligent in that we start to work hard. We recognize God's given me a purpose. We become more frugal because we spend our money on things that matter, not on frivolous things. And we're careful to make sure we're providing for things in the right way. And as we become more diligent and frugal, wealth increases. And Wesley wrote this on a tour of the nation around the Methodist churches that had grown up massively under his ministry. And this is in 1786. And it was his thoughts upon Methodism. As he was coming to the end of his life and he was thinking, what's going to happen to the movement after I've gone? He says, the Methodists in every place grow diligent and frugal. Consequently, they increase in goods. Hence, they proportionately increase in pride, in anger, in the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and the pride of life. So although the form of religion remains, the spirit is swiftly vanishing away. So he could see a future for Methodism where there was a architecture of Methodist chapels full of religious people worshipping God but the spirit had left because they were loving the world more than they were loving Jesus the heart going out of the movement and Wesley's own commitment to giving to money was consistent throughout his life As a student at Oxford, he lived on £28 a year. As his earnings increased to £30 and eventually to £120, which would have made him a very wealthy man in those days, he continued to live on £28 a year. Right to the end of his life. He told people that if at his death he had more than £10 in his possession, they could call him a robber. We know that we know Jesus... Because he's changed the focus of our love, of our desire. Verse 17, the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. See, whatever the world offers, it's fleeting and it's temporary. To know Jesus is to know eternal life, and to follow Jesus is to live forever. Now, John ends his letter this way, and it's an enigmatic verse. Um, But it makes sense in terms of what we're talking about today. Look at this, verse 21 of chapter 5. Just flick over your page. He ends the letter simply by saying, Dear children, keep yourself from idols. Dear children, keep yourself from idols. Everything and anything that we love in the world more than God is an idol. The second commandment is, you shall have No other gods before me. We know that we know God because we love God rather than the idols of the world. The three-legged stool of our assurance then by which we can know that we know God. You're going to tell them with me, aren't we? We live like Jesus, we love like Jesus, and we don't love the world. We live like Jesus, we love like Jesus, and we don't love the world. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this teaching of the Apostle John to that early church that he was writing to, but thank you that it has been recorded for us uh, in our own context and time. And we pray today that you would help us be those whose walk and talk are consistent that we might love your word and walk in obedience to the teaching of your word, that we might live like Jesus. We pray that we would be a community that John is talking about, a community where people say, look how they love one another. And help us if there's anything in us of needing reconciliation with a brother or a sister. Help us to put that right. And Father, we hear these words of Jesus. What does it profit a man that he gain the whole world yet lose his soul? And we thank you that in Jesus you have forgiven all our sins. That in Jesus you have revealed yourself to be our Lord. And we want to submit all that we are to him and to say, Lord Jesus, you are our Lord and our God. And we worship you. So strengthen us to live like you, to love like you, and not love the world. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Okay, should we stand as we sing our final song for this morning? Perhaps there's something about how we are living that God just wants to change and challenge in us. Or how we're loving that God just wants to reshape. Or perhaps there's something around our attitude towards this world that God just wants to realign with his kingdom. Let's just take a moment and allow the Holy Spirit to minister to us. Father, thank you that none of this is our work of just trying harder. All of this is your work of your spirit, your grace, your drawing near to us that we might draw near to you. 
Lord, thank you that we can be assured of our salvation because of the fruit we see in our lives, the way we're becoming more like Jesus. As individuals, as a church family, we're becoming more like Jesus. Lord, as we go from here, we go into battle. As we leave this door, we're being pulled in one direction with the love we have for you. We're being pulled in another direction with this inclination that our sinful hearts have towards the things of this world. And we just pray, Lord, help us as we go from here this week. And so may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Amen. Friends, our time's come to an end, but church isn't finished. We've got prayer ministry, red lanyards at the front. If you want to pray with someone, come and pray. We've got tea and coffee at the back. It would really bless us if on your way out, you pop your Bibles at the back so that they're there for tonight's service. God bless.